live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Q, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Hi everybody, welcome to day two of MIT IQ. We're here at MIT's Tang Center. This is the MIT Chief Data Officer Conference. It's the ninth year of this event, and theCUBE is in its third year of coverage here. And this event has really evolved from one of a focus on information quality, which is kind of a very boring but important topic, but with the big data theme exploding, it's really evolved into a Chief Data Officer and more of a big data, and even evolving into an analytics event. I'm here with Paul Gillen, and Paul, I want to talk a little bit about the sort of evolution of not only this event, but the role of the chief data officer. As I said, it's sort of the boring but important category, and it's, it's still got at least one foot stuck in that camp, and there's, but there's, there seems to be a bubbling up of desire by the community to really focus on innovation. Uh, and so we heard yesterday, for example, that maybe the title should be analytics and data or data and analytics, and many people are proposing putting analytics first. Analytics being the engine of innovation for a lot of companies, but still there's a lot of discussion here around governance, uh, certainly security, you know, where does that fit into the organization? Uh, you were in the keynotes this morning, what's your take on what you heard and what I just said? Well, I think the analytics, uh, the analytics angle is, is important, Dave, that's a great point. Uh, the problem with that being that the, the title then uh, becomes, the acronym becomes CAD, uh, C-A-D, <laughs> so we're going to have to figure that problem out. But you know, you and I have been covering this event for three years now, and it's been very interesting to see how, the, how it's evolved. Two years ago when we were first here, the Chief Data Officer concept was really new, and people were sort of talking about, well, what is it, and how is it going to evolve, and do we need it? And and then last year, there was a lot of excitement because we had people with CDO titles who were here. And we had, uh, and, and of course in the last year we've had the, uh, the White House establishing a chief data officer, and just a, a, a lot of bubbling enthusiasm over the growth of this concept and how this was going to take over the world. This year, you, you know, you're, you're familiar of course with the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, I think we're a little bit in a trough of disillusionment right now. Uh, I, I'm hearing CDOs in these panels talk a lot about uh, data quality problems, about data structure, about the need to get a handle on the data they have. It seems like a lot of the work that they're still doing is, is basic bricks and mortar, finding out where the data is, getting it in a form that's useful, figuring out what the governance principles were. Very interesting discussion this morning came up over what is the role of the chief data officer? Is it to permit or to enable access data or to restrict access to data? And one of the panelists was, um, was Nick Marco, who we had on theCUBE yesterday, and uh, works in the healthcare industry, and he was saying, you know, we've got HIPAA, we've got this 20-year-old rule that basically said you can't do anything with data. And yet we have, and, and this new concept of big data comes on, and suddenly we want to do things with data. And you know what? Our patients want us to do things with data as well, because it's going to improve the experience for them. But we've got government rules that say, no, thou shalt not touch. And so the CDO in healthcare is, is in sort of a, a, a sentry, a guardian role, which is really an, the antithesis of what we want to do with big data. So I think there's a bit of a crisis going on right now of trying to figure out how this role goes from being a caretaker and, and a, an architect to being a business enabler and an innovator. So I think there are a lot of similarities with what we were talking about yesterday with one of our guests about the, the whole notion of governance and, and, and compliance. And it, it really started in 2006 when the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure uh, came out and essentially made electronic documents admissible. And what happened then is every company scrambled, and there were a number of high-profile cases. I think Morgan Stanley was one, and there was a, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits, and were judges who just didn't understand. Well, why can't you produce an email? You know? Right. What do you mean you deleted it? <laughs> so, um, so everybody scrambled to try to plug that hole, and they were focusing on you know little pieces of that. And then what happened is it became very much a procedural thing because plaintiffs' attorneys would attack the process. So if you could show that you had a process, then you could say, well, and it's technology and it's really complicated, but we have a process and here's our process. We delete everything after n number of days or we retain everything for this period of time and then we defensively delete it. I think as the industry has become more sophisticated and technology has become more sophisticated and the legal systems have adapted more, the 
processes and infrastructure and software has to evolve as well, and it is. The problem is there's now so much more data. Now the other piece is that you've got this idea of information as a liability, which is why you need a guardian, right. and you've got information as an asset. And with the big data meme hitting, information became more of perceived as value as opposed to this thing that we have to manage through a life cycle. You still have to manage it through a life cycle, but that was the sort of tail wagging the dog where the general counsel was you know, sort of in charge. And now the lines of business saying, screw that. <laughs> we have you know, an opportunity. I'm going to run with it and I'm going to initiate a project and Hadoop or whatever, you know, analytics project, you know, the CMO versus the, the CIO spend, i.e. the CMO spending more than the CIO, and they don't care, certainly as much, if at all, about governance, compliance, and maybe, maybe to a lesser extent security, but they may not be in a position to, to affect security the way they should. As a result, those pieces, those corporate edicts get bolted on, which we know is a recipe for disaster. So, that's the interesting tension here, is asset versus liability. And I think that's a balance that the CDO is going to have to manage. At one point, we felt like it was the CIO's job to do that. It never became the CIO's job. So is it the CDO's job? Well, I, I think it's, uh, your point is, is great. It's the, this is, exa is exactly the kind of issues that CDOs are dealing with, and there is precedent in what CIOs went through. You know, for, yeah. for many, many years, this, the CIOs went through exactly this same problem. Your, your role, on the one hand, is to protect and secure that's your primary role, and your secondary role is to enable and, and, and to, to uh, innovate. And what happened is I think CEOs got so focused on the protect and secure that they became the guys who said no. And that was negative for the, C, the CIO, the perception of the CIO role. I don't think CIOs have ever really recovered from the perception that they are the naysayers, uh, uh, the people who, who frustrate innovation. And, I think you're right, CDOs are entering exactly this same kind of problem where they've been given uh, responsibility for this hugely important asset and on the one hand they have to protect it and certainly in regulated industries that's job one, but on the other hand you know, you've got to do something useful with it and the, and the, the, the uh, business people are about pounding on the door saying we need access to that data and here's the CDO being the guy who says no. And we heard um, from uh, Sandy Pentland uh, yesterday about Enigma, uh, basically a you know inspired by the the Bitcoin blockchain, potentially a new architecture for internet security, but also privacy, and the notion being okay encrypt everything, distribute it into a black box, never share the raw data, never expose the raw data to anybody, uh, and and eliminate the need for a trusted third party, which increases your threat matrix. Uh, a whole new concept. The problem, of course, is how do we apply that to all the applications and data? It's getting people to use created. it, right? I mean, right. the government just suffered a, a theft of 21 and a half million records of federal employees, and it turns out that these records were stored in plain text. <laughs> they weren't encrypted. Uh, this is the federal government. Uh, you know, if the, if the federal government can't set an example for industry, what's industry to follow? So this basic blocking and tackling, I think what Sandy was talking about, this, this, uh, this idea of a, of a trustless uh, encryption scheme is, uh, is, is a fabulous concept, but getting people to use it, you know, we can't even get them to patch SSL, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> Huge expense uh, in order to do that. So maybe this says the security business is going to be a good growth business for a lot of the companies that we, we follow in this space. You know, but nonetheless, I think that it underscores that example you just gave, and many, many others underscore the security with this cloud, mobile, big data, social world is, is kind of a do-over. You hear Intel talking about putting you know, security at the, at the chip level. We hear you know, folks like MIT and others, IBM's been working on this, and uh, Samsung's been working on a, you know, a similar type of distributed scheme, uh, again, inspired by the Bitcoin blockchain, um, as a, a new sort of paradigm for security, but the, the implementation of that is going to take decades. <laughs> well, so. I, the encouraging thing about what Sandy said yesterday, I thought, was we can solve the security problem. You know, we, we, there's no reason why we ever have to unencrypt data. And once data is permanently encrypted, then you don't have a security problem anymore. Um, the, the, the problem, again, is the devil is in the details. 
and uh, and getting getting uh, uh, the blocking and tackling of these kinds of technologies to be broadly adopted. It it just doesn't it doesn't happen. It doesn't get broadly adopted. So I think that one of the things that you that that comes into focus at events like this is the the organizational issues. You know, we heard well. First first of all, who has a CDO? Most companies do, still don't have a chief data officer. I think it's very clear that in finance, healthcare, government. It's happening and will continue to happen. There's momentum there and it's seeping into mainstream, but mainstream has not adopted this approach nearly as much as those three industries. In fact, if you go to a lot of the conferences that we're at and you ask people who thinks there should be a CDO that's separate from the CIO and shouldn't report to the CIO, m many in our industry feel as though that it's not necessary, that it's the CIO's job, um, which I think we agree it's not. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but there's a chief security officer in most companies, most Global 2000. Where does he or she report? Does that report now into the CDO? So there are organizational issues. Where does the CDO report? Well, do I have a CDO? Where does that CDO report? Where does the CIO report? We flip-flop from you know, COO to CFO, sometimes even you know, in the Y2K days it was this, the CEO. So that's been a sort of a, a, a musical chair. So there are significant organizational issues that, that have to be resolved. Have you heard much here about those? Uh, I, I think with the the sub theme of almost everything, every, everybody is talking about is organizational because they're talking about they're still talking about what is the CDO responsible for, mm -hmm. and so that fundamentally comes down to whom does he or she report to, and 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 what are the metrics for success? So yeah. I absolutely, yeah. So so it's interesting. So we're going to be talking about this and other topics today. We get a lot of practitioners on, you know, from folks from from MIT. We got a lot of guys c coming from the uh, the government. Government, yeah. Our first guest from uh, the uh, um, office of the Under Secretary of Defense. Right. So, so the, a lot of good thinking is going on, you know, within government government organizations, building frameworks and 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 and, and processes and beginning to implement them. So, we're going to unpack these issues today. This is day two MIT IQ. We got a crowd chat going at at crowdchat.net slash MITIQ, so weigh in there, ask us questions there. This is theCUBE, theCUBE is SiliconANGLE Wikibon's live production, we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. Myself, Paul Gill, and Sam Kahane will also be sitting in today. So keep it right there, everybody. We've got a day long at MIT in Cambridge, Mass. We'll be right back. <laughs>